Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 18th of August. As always, I have the chapters, so you can jump to any particular update you care about. New videos this week, I dived into the Entra Security Service Edge. This is all about bringing access to any internet-based service, more control over cross-tenant access settings for Microsoft 365, and private access to any app, not just those that are web-based. So I dive into all of that technology, how it's working. And then I look to the new protected actions, um, how that works, how that ties into authentication context and conditional access to protect the most critical type actions. And so you know what I started to do? I'm gonna create little shorts, sub 60 seconds, that summarizes each of the bigger videos. And there was an outtake video, if you missed it, this week when my dogs uh, decided to help when I was doing one of those shorts, which led to a new t-shirt. And someone pointed out that people don't know this story is there. All the money goes to cure childhood cancer. So all of the profit just goes directly to them from it. And so the new t-shirt was bugger right off, which you can hear me shouting in the background as I was trying to shoo the dogs away. So now you'll see that under the videos and in the tab. Again, it's just a way to maybe try and help uh, that charity. So there you go. All right, new updates. On the compute side, so the MV3 version virtual machines are now in preview. So this is the next generation of this medium memory virtual machine series. So this is all about running in memory SAP HANA workloads in Azure. It's these fourth gen Intel um, processors, DDR5, RAM, and it's using Azure Boost, which I've talked about before, which is a technology that can enhance the storage and network performance of virtual machines. So you're gonna see those improvements uh, on this. It also can help with some isolation um, from security perspective, and you can get it both with and without temporary storage, so with the, the D variant or not. Azure Container Apps now have cores in GA. So remember, Azure Container Apps abstracts away the AKS that is there, but it means I don't have to focus on AKS. It adds things like Dapper for my microservices. It adds Kada for my better scaling. There's network services. So it really makes it simpler to just get up and running with my um, containerized services. And so cause is that cross-origin resource sharing. And really what it means is if I have some app running in a browser, I can now go and use a service whose domain does not match that of the source application. So what I would do is on that other site that it's calling, so on this app, I can say, well, which origins, which sources will I allow to interact with this application? Also in container apps, the init container has gone GA. So the point of an init container, it runs in the same pod, but it's gonna run before the application container runs in the pod. So the idea is the init container can set things up that I need running in that environment. So this could be setting up accounts, uh, setting up database connections, running some kind of script. I could have multiple init containers, but they're gonna run in series. So the first init container would have to run to completion, then the next, and only once all the init containers have run to completion will the application pod actually start. So this is a way to get that replica set up ready to run whatever the application workload actually is. Um, session affinity has also gone GA. So this is, if I have my HTTP-based workloads, I can have session affinity, i.e. sticky sessions. So all requests from the same client would go to the same container apps replica. Uh, this is common if I have a stateful workload, it's just gonna use a cookie that's used to track the replica for a session. You shouldn't enable this by default because obviously what it is gonna do is make all requests from that client go to the same replica. So that may end up with a less than ideal distribution of clients to the possible replicas. But turn it on if I do have a more stateful workload that I require that. So it's an option that I can turn on if I need it. Also container apps, there are now secret volumes. So if I do need to have some secret, I can expose it, yes, from the environment variables, Dapper has capabilities about that as well, but I can now expose via Azure Key Vault. So there'd be a managed identity which has permission to the secret in the Key Vault, and then it will be surfaced as a mounted volume to the pod. 
Now I could have multiple secrets being exposed via the same mount, like slash MNT slash um, secrets, for example. And I can now make those integrated with the Key Vault. AKS now has native private link service. So the goal here is I now don't have to separately go and configure a private link service to whatever service I'm running inside my Kubernetes environment. Now using annotations on the internal load balancer, it will just go and configure the private link service for me. So there are a bunch of new annotations and the documentation walks through those. If we look at the cloud provider documentation. Okay, so here we can see it decided to load and you can see these private link specific annotations that it's been added to. So, hey, I want this set to true. So I want to create the PLS and then just a bunch of details. And at the bottom, it actually gives you a full example of how you would use this with, hey, it's an internal load balancer and then create the PLS and the service name, what I want to expose, et cetera, et cetera. So that is now available to us. And if we jump, keep going. So also now in Kubernetes 1.27 is supported uh, with AKS, so with all the updates that that contains. We now have durable Azure functions using the Python V2 uh, programming model. So that's gonna be more familiar and more consistent with a uh, Python developer it's gonna be just more logical to them. So that has now gone into GA. And also Azure Functions, the .NET worker, the isolated worker where I can have a different version of .NET from that of the underlying host, well that now has App Insights integration. So what that means is it's going to emit the telemetry directly to my App Insights SDK, which replaces the behavior of before it had to basically relay those logs through the host itself. And it also supports new binding types. So what I could now do is things like the Azure SDK for .NET, I can hook into various types of service. And what that really means is when I do the bindings through here, you can talk about our Azure blobs, Azure queues, service bus, event hubs, Cosmos DB. When I integrate with that SDK directly, it's gonna open up some maybe new opportunities, some new capabilities that I didn't previously have. So for example, maybe it's a larger size blob that I could write. So I'm gonna get new capabilities. On the networking side, Azure Firewall has new monitoring and logging capabilities, some in GA, some in preview. So on the GA side, it now has structured logs. So instead of it being this free form text, which is fairly difficult to work with, it's now a predefined schema. And if I have a predefined schema, it makes it much easier to query that data it's gonna reduce latency of the queries. It's gonna give me more specific information because now I'll have separate tables, for example, application rules, network rules, DNS proxy. I can set different role-based access controls and permissions to particular sets of data from it. There's also a latency probe is now in GA, so I can see the overall latency of Azure Firewall. And then in preview, they have a resource health monitor for Azure Firewall and also an embedded firewall workbook to give me insights and statistics about Azure Firewall. And then virtual network flow logs are in preview. So this is different from what we have with NSG flow logs. With NSG flow logs, I can enable this flow logging to a storage account where there is an NSG applied, but I have to be able to have an NSG applied so it doesn't work for things like, hey, a gateway subnet where I can't apply the NSG. This I can enable at the VNet level. So it will remove those limitations before we had with the NSGs about where we can apply it. It'll still integrate with things like traffic analytics, but what it will now do is not just give me insight into, well, hey, um, allow, deny based on NSG rules, it will also show based on the virtual network manager uh, security admin rules. It can evaluate if there is encryption on the network traffic based on virtual network encryption. It still won't capture the data if it's from a private endpoint, but if it's from a regular VM going to a PE, then that flow would get captured. So a lot of night benefits here, it's gonna go to storage count, and hey, I can start playing with that in preview. On the storage side, so Azure NetApp Files now has integration with Azure VMware solution for cloud backup. 
So if I'm using ANF for my Azure VMware solution storage of the virtual machines, which I might do because I want separate scaling of my storage from the nodes in my AVS, what I can now do is have VM consistent snapshots using the ANF directly. So there's a cloud backup virtual appliance I install into the Azure VMware solution cluster. Then based on policies, I can do automated backups of the VMs. It's gonna be super fast because it's using the Azure Native File snapshot capability. I can also restore them really quick. So I'll get a lower recovery point, recovery time objective. There's also now NFS v4.1 ID domains. So if I don't have um, LDAP enabled volumes, I can still configure this, which would help prepare for a future LDAP implementation. Or maybe just currently I'm struggling with uh, root type permissions and it will solve those issues. So that's now in preview. Premium SSD v2 and ultra disk incremental snapshots have gone GA. So what the incremental snapshots let me do is the point in time uh, backup of a virtual machine. And after the initial snapshot, which still has to be a full, the incrementals after that will only have to store the delta. And what it does is it actually stores it to a standard HDD storage. So it's gonna be much cheaper for that storage. It's only gonna charge you based on the delta. Now, because it is having to move that data to a standard HDD, there is a delay. So the point in which I create the snapshot, there's gonna be a background copy process. And so I can't use the snapshot until that background copy process is completed. So there'll be a little delay in creating the snapshot and being able to use it because I have to wait for that backup copy process to complete. But now, hey, uh, super cost effective. It will use ZRS if the region has ZRS. If not, it will be LRS. And I can have up to 500 of these incremental snapshots per disk. Oh. Um, and Elastic San, so remember Elastic San is an in preview service, but it gives me an iSCSI block target as a native Azure storage solution. So it's going to be able to be consumed by anything that could use an iSCSI target. Well, what it now has is support for private endpoints, which is super useful for private connectivity from a virtual network, and also shared volumes. So if I have a scenario, for example, a cluster, and I want to connect to the same iSCSI volume I can. It's going to support persistent reservations. So I could use it for things like Windows Server failover clusters and just where I need some read um, write to the same volume from multiple nodes. Uh, I can do that with ElasticSAN. On the database side, uh, Azure Backup support for cross-region PostgreSQL restore. So I don't have to now have um, a failover of the region I can still restore that back up to the paired region at any time, not just drawing an outage. Cosmos DB for PostgreSQL now has Terraform support. So Terraform is an alternate infrastructure as code wow. solution where I define a declarative state of what I want. So I can both create and modify now my Cosmos DB for Postgres. Remember, this is the Citus extension use, replace the old PostgreSQL hyperscale. So for that really large scale, large capacity requirements, well now I can create and manage it using Terraform. By manage, I mean modify. Uh, Cosmos DB uh, for PostgreSQL now has Azure AD integration. So I can use um, Azure AD authentication, managed identities, I can use that only, or I could combine it with the native PostgreSQL authentication as well. And then PostgreSQL Flexible now has auto grow and online scaling. So if auto grow, it will automatically increase the amount of provision storage based on as I'm writing the data to it. So I don't have to super worry about right sizing it all up front. Now, if a server has less than one terabyte of provision storage, it's gonna auto grow when that consumption reaches 80%. If you have more than one terabyte of storage, it will start auto growing at 90% consumption. Now, at four terabyte, that's kind of this special number in Azure storage, it can't auto grow automatically. You will have to manually do an offline operation to move past the at four terabyte line. But outside of crossing that boundary, it can automatically do it and um, it's online. There's no offline operation required. And then finally, miscellaneous. 
Um, Azure load testing is in new regions, Japan, East and Brazil, South. Remember, Azure load testing provides a managed service to either run my uh, JMeter scripts to emulate based on requests per second or virtual users, or there's even quick tests where I just say, hey, this is what I'm trying to do, and it will create the JMeter script for me. And that was it. Uh, as always, I hope that was useful. Until the next video, take care.